This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Seven Modern Times. Madame Sarre. Book Seven, Chapter Five The Visere Cabinet. The Sarre household was established with modest decency in a pretty flat situated in a new building. Sarre loved his wife in a calm and tranquil fashion. He was often kept late from home by the commission on the budget, and he worked more than three nights a week at a report on the postal finances of which he hoped to make a masterpiece. Eveline thought she could twist him round her finger, and this did not displease him. The bad side of their situation was that they had not much money. In truth, they had very little. The servants of the Republic do not grow rich in her service as easily as people think. Since the Sovereign is no longer there to distribute favors, each of them takes what he can, and his depredations, limited by the depredations of all the others, are reduced to modest proportions. Hence that austerity of morals that is noticed in democratic leaders. They can only grow rich during periods of great business activity, and then they find themselves exposed to the envy of their less favored colleagues. Hippolyte Serre had for a long time foreseen such a period. He was one of those who had made preparations for its arrival. Whilst waiting for it, he endured his poverty with dignity, and Eveline shared that poverty without suffering as much as one might have thought. She was in close intimacy with the Reverend Father Douillard, and frequented the chapel of St. Orberosia, where she met with serious society and people in a position to render her useful services. She knew how to choose among them, and gave her confidence to none but those who deserved it. She had gained experience since her motor excursions with Viscount Clena, and above all, she had now acquired the value of a married woman. The deputy was at first uneasy about these pious practices which were ridiculed by the demagogic newspapers. But he was soon reassured, for he saw all around him democratic leaders joyfully becoming reconciled to the aristocracy and the church. They found that they had reached one of those periods which often recur when advance had been carried a little too far. Hippolyte Serre gave a moderate support to this view. His policy was not a policy of persecution, but a policy of tolerance. He had laid its foundations in his splendid speech on the preparations for reform. The Prime Minister was looked upon as too advanced. He proposed schemes which were admitted to be dangerous to capital, and the great financial companies were opposed to him. Of course it followed that the papers, of all views, supported the companies. Seeing the danger increasing, the Cabinet abandoned its schemes, its program, and its opinions, but it was too late. A new administration was already ready. An insidious question by Paul Visere, which was immediately made the subject of a resolution, and a fine speech by Hippolyte Serre overthrew the cabinet. The President of the Republic entrusted the formation of a new cabinet to this same Paul Visere, who, though still very young, had been a minister twice. He was a charming man, spending much of his time in the green rooms of theatres, very artistic, a great society man of amazing ability and industry. Paul Visere formed a temporary ministry intended to reassure public feeling, which had taken alarm, and Hippolyte Serre was invited to hold office in it. The new ministry, belonging to all the groups in the majority, represented the most diverse and contrary opinions, but they were all moderate and convinced conservatives. The author interrupts at this point to say, as this ministry exercised considerable influence upon the destinies of the country and of the world, we think it well to give its composition. Minister of the Interior and Prime Minister, Paul Visere, Minister of Justice, Pierre Bou, Foreign Affairs, Victor Cromville, Finance, Terrasson, Education, La Villette, Commerce, Posts and Telegraphs, Hippolyte Serre, Agriculture, Olac, Public Works, La Person, War, General de Bonheur, Admiralty, Admiral Vivier de Moraine. And then the author continues by saying, The Minister of Foreign Affairs was retained from the former cabinet. He was a dark little man called Cromville, who worked fourteen hours a day with the conviction that he dealt with tremendous questions. 
He refused to see even his own diplomatic agents, and was terribly uneasy, though he did not disturb anybody else, for the want of foresight of peoples is infinite, and that of governments is just as great. The office of public works was given to a socialist, Fortune La Personne. It was then a political custom, and one of the most solemn, most severe, most rigorous, and if I may dare say so, the most terrible and cruel of all political customs, to include a member of the Socialist Party in each ministry intended to oppose socialism, so that the enemies of wealth and property should suffer the shame of being attacked by one of their own party, and so that they could not unite against these forces without turning to someone who might possibly attack themselves in the future. Nothing but a profound ignorance of the human heart would permit the belief that it was difficult to find a socialist to occupy these functions. Citizen Fortune La Personne entered the Visere cabinet of his own free will and without any constraint, and he found those who approved of his action even among his former friends, so great was the fascination that power exercised over the penguins. General Debonair went to the war office. He was looked upon as one of the ablest generals in the army, but he was ruled by a woman, the Baroness Bildermann, who, though she had reached the age of intrigue, was still beautiful. She was in the pay of a neighboring and hostile power. The new minister of marine, the worthy Admiral Vivier de Moraine, was generally regarded as an excellent seaman. He displayed a piety that would have seemed excessive in an anti-clerical minister, if the Republic had not recognized that religion was of great maritime utility. Acting on the instruction of his spiritual director, the Reverend Father Douillard, the worthy Admiral had dedicated his fleet to St. Orborosia and directed canticles in honor of the Alcan Virgin to be composed by Christian bards. These replaced the national hymn in the music played by the navy. Prime Minister Visere declared himself to be distinctly anti-clerical, but ready to respect all creeds. He asserted that he was a sober-minded reformer. Paul Visere and his colleagues desired reforms, and it was in order not to compromise reform that they proposed none, for they were true politicians and knew that reforms are compromised the moment they are proposed. The government was well received, respectable people were reassured, and the funds rose. The administration announced that four new ironclads would be put into commission, that prosecutions would be undertaken against the socialists, and it formally declared its intention to have nothing to do with any inquisitorial income tax. The choice of Terrasson as Minister of Finance was warmly approved by the press, Terrasson, an old minister famous for his financial operations, gave warrant to all the hopes of the financiers and shadowed forth a period of great business activity. Soon, those three udders of modern nations, monopolies, bill discounting, and fraudulent speculation, were swollen with the milk of wealth. Already whispers were heard of distant enterprises and of planting colonies, and the boldest put forth in the newspapers the project of a military and financial protectorate over in Agricia. Without having yet shown what he was capable of, Hippolyte Serre was considered a man of weight. Business people thought highly of him. He was congratulated on all sides for having broken with the extreme sections, the dangerous men, and for having realized the responsibilities of government. Madame Serre shone alone amid the minister's wives. Cromville withered away in bachelordom. Paul Visere had married money in the person of Mademoiselle Blampignon, an accomplished, estimable, and simple lady who was always ill and whose feeble health compelled her to stay with her mother in the depths of a remote province. The other ministers' wives were not born to charm the sight, and people smiled when they read that Madame Labillette had appeared at the presidency ball wearing a headdress of birds of paradise. Madame Vivier de Morin, a woman of good family, was stout rather than tall, had a face like a beefsteak, and the voice of a newspaper seller. Madame de Bonheur, tall, dry, and florid, was devoted to young officers. She ruined herself by her escapades and crimes, and only regained consideration by dint of ugliness and insolence. Madame Serret was the charm of the ministry, and its tied to consideration. Young, beautiful, and irreproachable, she charmed alike society and the masses by her combination of elegant costumes and pleasant smiles. Her receptions were thronged by the great Jewish financiers. She gave the most fashionable garden parties in the Republic. The newspapers described her dresses, and the milliners did not ask her to pay for them. 
She went to Mass, she protected the chapel of St. Orborosia from the ill will of the people, and she aroused in aristocratic hearts the hope of a fresh concordat. With her golden hair, grey eyes, and supple and slight though rounded figure, she was indeed pretty. She enjoyed an excellent reputation, and she was so adroit and calm, so much mistress of herself, that she would have preserved it intact, even if she had been discovered in the very act of ruining it. The session ended with a victory for the cabinet, which, amid the almost unanimous applause of the House, defeated a proposal for an inquisitorial tax, and with a triumph for Madame Serret, who gave parties in honor of three kings who were at the moment passing through Alca. End of Book 7, Chapter 5